According to experts, Homo neanderthalensis, also referred to as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, was a late archaic form of human that diverged from modern human lineages no earlier than 500,000 years ago and largely disappeared from Europe and Asia by 40,000 years ago. In fact, in regards to the morphological distinction between modern humans and Neanderthals, many now recognize them as subspecies. Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis in accordance with their overlapping morphology and genetics. Indeed, the blood that coursed through this long extinct species had more in common with us than we once believed. Neanderthals had the full range of modern human blood types. A new study discovered that a Neanderthal woman's 100,000-year-old remains from Siberia's Denisova cave had type A blood, as did another Neanderthal woman's 48,000-year-old remains from nearby Chagyaskaya cave, and the 64,000-year-old remains of another Neanderthal woman from Croatia's Vindija cave had type B blood. The most parsimonious explanation is that the ancestors of Neanderthals and modern humans already possessed the full range of the ABO system. Until recently, given that all chimps are type A and all gorillas are type B, it was assumed that all Neanderthals were type O. All three Neanderthals, however, carried the now rare rhesus blood type known as rhesus plus incomplete, which had only been discovered in the DNA of one member of Australia's Western Desert Aboriginal people. At the time, it was thought to be a new rhesus type that had emerged in Australia. This rare rhesus type has also been discovered in 80 people in Papua New Guinea. Now we know that rhesus plus incomplete had existed in the past and was lost in most modern populations. Because of these mismatched RH blood types, interbreeding with Homo sapiens means there's a one in five chance of producing a baby with homophilic disease, which may explain why Neanderthal sapiens inbreeding was limited. Furthermore, the analysis of the growth rates of Neanderthal toddlers has led researchers to hypothesize that Neanderthal babies grew faster in their early years than Homo sapiens, potentially putting a strain on their mother's health. Neanderthals had a massive brain and must have had a high protein and fat diet as children to fuel rapid brain growth. Neanderthal mothers most likely had to consume a large number of calories from meat to produce enough milk. This energy-intensive child-rearing may have also caused slightly longer interbirth intervals and reduced birth rates. Even if you have no interest in Neanderthals, these unions are thought to have contributed to a range of traits modern humans carry today, including skin tone and hair color. However, we know now that these two different human populations did meet and exchange genes. And here is a hypothetical encounter. This hypothetical story emphasizes the mutual curiosity and cultural differences between two different human species. It's a moment of connection between individuals from distinct worlds portrayed with care and respect. She was a young Neanderthal and gambled about the countryside as naked as a monkey, her body adapted to the cold climate. She was short, around five feet tall, but had good posture and pale skin, light brown hair and a good tan. Around her neck she wore a bracelet of eagle talons. He was a tall Cro-Magnon man, around six feet, a hunter clad in an animal skin coat with a wolf fur trim. He had olive skin, long legs, and long dark brown hair, and his facial features were softer and more gracile than Neanderthal man. She was a daughter of the ancient forest, her senses sharp like the animals she hunted. Her people, the Neanderthals, had long roamed these lands, and the dense woods held no secrets from her. She was strong, her muscles honed by years of survival, with a sturdy frame that spoke of resilience. Her large eyes were intelligent and observant, ever watchful of her surroundings. As the sun dipped lower in the sky, the two found themselves drawn together by a shared warmth, both literal and metaphorical. The Neanderthal woman with her strength and the Homo sapiens man with his quick mind communicated through actions rather than words. They shared a fire, testing the boundaries of their mutual curiosity. The night deepened, and he admired her raw power, her presence, an embodiment of the ancient world. She, in turn, was fascinated by his subtle grace and the newness he brought. In the firelight, their differences faded. They shared something primal, 
a connection that transcended time. It's impossible to say for sure whether female Neanderthals preferred early modern human males or the other way around, but there are some indications. Homo sapiens females appeared to prefer mating with Denisovan males, at least in Papua New Guinea, implying the potential nature of those relationships. However, there is some evidence that Neanderthal males with high testosterone were more adventurous than modern humans. As a result, it stands to reason that Neanderthal male Y chromosomes would resemble Denisovan male Y chromosomes. However, when scientists sequenced the DNA from three Neanderthals who lived 38,000 to 53,000 years ago, they were surprised to find that their Y chromosomes were more similar to those of modern humans. The researchers claim this is evidence of strong gene flow between Neanderthals and early modern humans, implying that they interbred extensively. So frequently, in fact, that as Neanderthal populations dwindled near the end of their time on Earth, their Y chromosomes may have become extinct and been replaced entirely by our own. This suggests that a large number of modern human men had genetic exchanges with female Neanderthals. But the story does not stop there. Other studies have found that Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, the cellular machinery that aids in the conversion of sugars into usable energy, suffered nearly identical fates. These are exclusively passed down from mothers to their children, so the discovery of early modern human mitochondria in Neanderthal remains suggest that our ancestors had genetic exchanges with male Neanderthals. This time, interbreeding is expected to have occurred between 270,000 and 100,000 years ago, most likely during warmer periods. Nonetheless, scientists know a surprisingly small amount about the period in human history when our species came together. According to an interview with French archaeologist Ludovac Slimak, when two populations are close together but very different, because they speak different languages and have different traditions, or because they live in neighboring territories, they will exchange women. And this is extremely important in terms of cultural anthropology because gene exchange is not always a romantic affair. Every traditional society is concerned with the identities that will be formed between two groups, which is referred to as patrilocality. That means that women have more mobility, which means that my sister will join your tribe and your sister will join my tribe. And we know from DNA that the question of patrilocality or women's mobility was also relevant to Neanderthals. But when we look at what happened at the point of contact 50,000 years ago, we can see that all sapiens have Neanderthal DNA, but no recent Neanderthal has modern Homo sapiens DNA. In other words, the last Neanderthals had ancient archaic Homo sapiens DNA, but they don't have modern Homo sapiens DNA. This is interesting because late Neanderthals had 10% archaic Homo sapiens DNA from earlier encounters, and this is a critical issue in understanding the extinction and the precise interaction of the two populations. Here's a sensitive and respectful narrative exploring the hypothetical encounter between Neanderthals and a Homo sapiens. The story is written with care, focusing on cultural aspects of the interactions. In the dense, mist-covered forests of the Caucasus Mountains 40,000 years ago, two groups of humans lived unaware of each other for millennia. The Neanderthals, with their powerful builds and deep-set eyes, had dominated the region for generations, their lives shaped by the cycles of the seasons and the rhythms of nature. Homo sapiens, taller and more agile, had recently begun their journey into this rugged land, wandering in search of new hunting grounds and territory. One afternoon, a group of Homo sapiens men stumbled upon something they had never seen before, a Neanderthal encampment. Smoke curled lazily from a central fire, and the air was thick with the scent of roasted meat and herbs. The Neanderthals, for all their differences, had a complex and vibrant culture, shaped by their long history of Ice Age survival. The Neanderthal men, broad-shouldered and wary, noticed the visitors immediately. Their language was rough, a series of guttural sounds and gestures, but it carried warmth, an invitation rather than a threat. With cautious curiosity, the Homo sapiens men approached. Both groups were aware of the other's existence. There had been sightings in the distance, whispered rumours around the fires, but this was the first time they stood face to face. 
After moments of tense silence, the Neanderthals extended their hands in greeting. A burly Neanderthal leader, his face lined with age and wisdom, beckoned the newcomers to sit by the fire. The Homo sapiens men exchanged nervous glances but followed the gesture, grateful for the warmth and the chance to rest. As the evening settled in, the two groups began to share food and drink. Though their languages differed, gestures and expressions bridged the gap. Laughter and nods of approval spread as they passed around chunks of roasted game and drank from leather skins filled with fermented berries. A sense of mutual respect and understanding grew between them, born out of their shared struggle against the unforgiving land. Then, as night fell and the stars emerged, the Neanderthal leader rose from his seat. He made a series of gestures, inviting over several women from their tribe. The leader spoke in his deep voice, and though the words were foreign to the Homo sapiens men, the intention was clear. As was customary in many ancient cultures, the Neanderthal tribe was offering a way to forge bonds between the two groups. The Homo sapiens men had their own customs and traditions, but they understood that this offer was a merging of bloodlines and a sign of goodwill. In the harsh world they inhabited, alliances were vital for survival, and such gestures could strengthen ties that might ensure the survival of both groups. After a moment of quiet contemplation, the Homo sapiens leader stood, meeting the gaze of the Neanderthal chief. He accepted the offer, but with a sense of reverence. This wasn't just an act of survival. It was a connection, a bridge between two worlds. Throughout the night, the two tribes celebrated together. In the firelight, their differences faded, and the shared humanness of both Neanderthal and Homo sapiens came to the forefront. They danced, sang, and told stories in their own ways, their voices rising into the night as one. In the days that followed, the Homo sapiens men remained with the Neanderthal tribe, learning from them, sharing knowledge, and participating in the rhythms of their life. And while the merging of the two groups did not erase their differences, it laid the foundation for a deeper connection, one that would endure as long as their survival depended on each other. In time, the children born from these unions carried the strength of both worlds, and their bloodlines would forever intertwine, a testament to the strange and beautiful ways in which humanity has always found a way to connect, even in the most ancient and untamed times. The Neanderthals were a tough species that had survived multiple ice ages and were likely familiar with volcanoes and other natural disasters. Little did they know, their days were numbered. Another recent study found that several volcanoes erupted in quick succession around 40,000 years ago in what is now known as Italy and the Caucasus Mountains, which stretch across Europe and Asia. After analysing pollen and ash from the affected area, Researchers concluded that the eruptions most likely reduced or wiped out local Neanderthal bands while indirectly affecting more distant populations. The researchers looked at sediment layers from around 40,000 years ago in Russia's Mesmaskaya cave and discovered that the layer with the most volcanic ash had the least amount of plant pollen. However, the eruptions 40,000 years ago were unlike anything Neanderthals had ever experienced. For starters, it appears that all of the volcanoes erupted simultaneously. One of those eruptions, the Campanian Ignimbrite, is thought to be Europe's most powerful in the last 200,000 years. Scientists examined all layers for volcanic ash signatures. The most volcanic ash-rich layer, which most likely corresponded to the Campanian Ignimbrite eruption near Naples, Italy, had no tree pollen and very little pollen from other types of plants. It was simply a sterile layer. The extinction of plants would have reduced the number of plant-eating mammals, affecting the Neanderthals, who hunted larger mammals for food. New data on the glacial period, which lasted from approximately 65,000 to 25,000 years ago, revealed that it was characterized by rapid, severe and abrupt changes that had far-reaching environmental consequences. Although Neanderthals were physically adapted to the cold, severe changes in conditions, often within individuals' lifetimes, left no time for populations to recover. For much of the last century, Neanderthals were portrayed as gorilla-like, knuckle-dragging brutes 
whose extinction some 30,000 years ago was the natural outcome of competing against a more intelligent, creative, and resourceful human species, Homo sapiens. It was once believed that Neanderthals dwelt in a state of astonishing savageness, walked around as naked as a monkey, and uttered sounds more like the cries of wild beasts than human speech. Despite these early misconceptions, Neanderthal man always had a full erect posture. 19th and early 20th century reconstructions of Neanderthals, and particularly the extensive reconstruction of the partial skeleton of an elderly male Neanderthal from the site of La Chapelle aux Saints in France, created images of these archaic humans as primitive and having an incompletely erect posture. Now, a team of researchers has completed a 3D virtual reconstruction of the La Chapelle aux Saints Neanderthal and found that he, and by extension other Neanderthals, had a fully erect posture. With that tantalizing statement, we leave you to contemplate the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, remain curious and stay questioning. Please subscribe, share and check out our channel's other videos. Thank you and take care.